Excerpts from Chapter 29 of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee Somehow I could think of nothing but Mr. Bob Ewell saying he'd get Atticus if it took him the rest of his life. Mr. Ewell almost got him, and it was the last thing he did. Are you sure? Atticus said bleakly. He's dead all right, said Mr. Tate. He's good and dead. He won't hurt these children again. I didn't mean that. Atticus seemed to be talking in his sleep. His age was beginning to show. One noticed not his jet black hair, but the gray patches growing at his temples. I went to Atticus and felt his arms go around me. I buried my head in his lap. We started home. Scout, raise up so Mr. Tate can hear you, Atticus said. I crawled into his lap. Then Jem said, hush a minute. I thought he was thinking. He always wants you to hush so he can think. Then he said he heard something. We didn't hear nothing. Then Jem yelled hello or something loud enough to wake the dead. Just a minute, Scout, said Mr. Tate. Mr. Finch, did you hear them? Atticus said he didn't. He had the radio on. Aunt Alexandra had hers going in her bedroom. I wonder if the neighbors heard anything, said Mr. Tate. I doubt it, heck. Most of them listen to their radios or go to bed with the chickens. Go ahead, Scout, Mr. Tate said. Well, after Jem yelled, we walked on. Mr. Tate, I was shut up in my costume, but I could hear it myself then. Footsteps, I mean. They walked when we walked, and stopped when we stopped. Mr. Tate rubbed his chin. I wondered why he had those marks on him. His sleeves were perforated with little holes. There were one or two little puncture marks on his arms to match the holes. Let me see that thing, if you will, sir. Atticus fetched the remains of my costume. Mr. Tate turned it over and bent it around to get an idea of its former shape. This thing probably saved her life, he said. Look. He pointed with a long forefinger. A shiny, clean line stood out on the dull wire. Bob Ewell meant business, Mr. Tate muttered. Atticus shook his head. I can't conceive of a man who'd... Mr. Finch, there's just some kind of men you have to shoot before you can say hi to them. Even then, they ain't worth the bullet it takes to shoot them. Yule is one of them, Mr. Tate sighed. We'd better get on. Scout, you heard him behind you. Then, all of a sudden, something grabbed me and mashed my costume. Think I ducked down the ground. Heard a tussling under the tree, sort of. They were bamming against the trunk, sounded like. Jem found me and started pulling me toward the road. Some Mr. Ewell yanked him down, I reckon. They tussled some more, and then there was this funny noise. Jem hollered. I stopped. That was Jem's arm. Anyway, Jem hollered, and I didn't hear him any more, and the next thing, Mr. Ewell was trying to squeeze me to death, I reckon. Then somebody yanked Mr. Ewell down. Jem must have got up, I guess. That's all I know. And then? Mr. Tate was looking at me sharply. Somebody was staggering around and panting and coughing fit to die. I thought it was Jem at first, but it didn't sound like him, so I went looking for Jem on the ground. I thought Atticus had come to help us and had got wore out. Who was it? Why, there he is, Mr. Tate. He can tell you his name. As I said it, I half pointed to the man in the corner. He was still leaning against the wall. As I pointed, he brought his arms down and pressed the palms of his hands against the wall. They were white hands, sickly white hands that had never seen the sun. His cheeks were thin to hollowness, and his gray eyes were so colorless I thought he was blind. A strange, small spasm shook him, but as I gazed at him in wonder, 
the tension slowly drained from his face. His lips parted into a timid smile, and our neighbor's image blurred with my sudden tears. Hey, boo, I said 